Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by Juniper Networks. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts, tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now a word about our sponsor, Juniper Networks. Organizations are constantly evolving and increasingly turning to multi-cloud to transform IT. Juniper's connected security gives organizations the ability to safeguard users, applications, and infrastructure by extending security to all points of connection across the network. Helping defend you against advanced threats, Juniper's connected security is also open so you can build on the security solutions and infrastructure you already have. Secure your entire business from your endpoints to your edge and every cloud in between with Juniper's connected security. Connect with Juniper on Twitter or Facebook. And we thank Juniper for making it possible to bring you Research Saturday. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. We were looking into APT32 activity on a sort of campaign that we'd been dealing with internally. We were already looking at the the threat actor. That's Tom Bonner. He's director of threat research at BlackBerry Silence. The research we're discussing today is titled Ocean Lotus Steganography Malware Analysis. As we came to sort of do a review of all the malware involved, we spotted a lot of the usual candidates, things like DNS tunneling, backdoors, Dennis, Roland and Remy, the other um, sort of remote access Trojans we've written about, and then came across another loader that you know, it didn't quite look like anything we'd seen before, but was clearly, you know, dropped by the Ocean Lotus APT32 threat actor, used at the same time. So we started looking into that, pulling it apart, and quickly became apparent that it was trying to decode information from PNG image files. Hmm. And, you know, luckily we were able to obtain a copy of those, started pulling that apart and seeing how it was processing the image. It was loading up a second stage payload. So that had been embedded in the image file, encrypted, and then it was re- reading it back out, decrypting it using AES, sort of de-obfuscating it. There was XOR and several other um, obfuscation layers on top before sort of finally injecting it into memory and, and running it. So um, yeah, all, all came off the back of a, an IR engagement, which you know really helps to tie these things down to specific threat actors. And just thought it was a very novel and, and interesting approach. Yeah. Before we, we dig in, what can you tell us about Ocean Lotus? Not a lot more than perhaps uh, in the the public domain right now. I tend not to deal too much with the attribution side of things. So, Mm. of course, many people are saying they're Vietnamese state-sponsored. I'm happy to go with that. But, you know, that aside, I think they're a very interesting group. They seem very prolific at the minute and investing very heavily in the, the sort of bespoke tooling to really establish a foothold within an organization and maintain a foothold and exfiltrate data. So they're using a good mix of sort of off-the-shelf tools, sort of commodity or commercial off-the-shelf applications, but they have invested an awful lot into their own development. So this is sort of really another phase of their bespoke tooling that uh, we've seen APT32 using. Well, let's walk through it uh, step by step. How does one initially find themselves having to deal with this problem? Very good question. For a number of uh, number of reasons, you might find yourself in that situation. I mean, recently we've seen Ocean Lotus targeting the automotive sector, uh, amongst others. Now, typically, to sort of leverage a foothold into an organization, they still use the same old tricks. You know, phishing works. It works well. We've seen them using even sort of phishing attempts for Mac recently to try and, you know, hook some targets on the Mac platform. Once they're in, or they can at least get some sort of a payload on a system, we'll usually see things like a Cobot Strike Beacon being deployed at that point. 
then they can recon systems. They'll start to pump down some more bespoke malware that they've perhaps written in house. Although even at those early stages, it's still often sort of throwaway samples. So we've started to see the steganography loader quite often at this point. We've seen the the Dennis DNS tunneling Trojan at this point, and a, a few other more basic remote access Trojans. They'll then start to be deployed, and they can look at moving laterally and spreading from there. And then finally, you know, even more bespoke remote access Trojans will be deployed, and they'll look at data exfiltration or sort of whatever their end game is within that environment. It was interesting in your report that one of the images that they used was a gentleman thief character from a Japanese manga series, Kaito Koroba. I suppose we have to give them style points for that. Absolutely, yeah, the the Kaito kid. Definitely give them some style points for that one. I mean, if it had been uh, Naruto or Pokemon, it might have been a bit more uh, easily identifiable. I certainly hadn't have heard of that particular series, but we had a few on our, <laughs> um, few on our APAC team who had. But no, um, in a way, that wasn't the perfect image for them because it was too small to hold the entire payload embedded in individual pixels. So the, the second image, which I believe came from an inspirational quotes website, that image was actually a little larger. So every portion of the payload was able to be encoded and embedded in an RGB pixel value. Whereas for the Kato Kid one, the image actually overflowed beyond the end of the sort of RGB pixel matrix. So the bulk of the data was actually just appended raw to the file, which I guess hmm. isn't entirely their intention when they came to make this. But yeah, it was just a sort of unfortunate side effect. Well, let's dig in some to the steganography itself. First of all, can you describe to us what is that? Steganography, in its its simplest terms, is basically embedding some sort of data into, in this case, an image for the purpose of, of hiding it. I mean, that technique has been around for an awfully long time, perhaps you know hundreds of years. And when combined with encryption as well, it can offer a very effective way of obscuring messages or, or payloads or concealing whatever information someone might like to conceal. And they went through some effort to, uh, in this process, to not overtly affect the actual image itself. You, you wouldn't look at it and, and know that there was something wrong. Exactly. So basically, each pixel in an image is assigned three color values. So you have a, a byte for the blue, a byte for the green, and a byte for the red. Uh, in addition, you know, most other sort of image encoding algorithms will use an extra byte for the alpha channel. That value would sort of represent how transparent the overall color is. But yeah, they, they just focus purely on the red, green, and blue bytes. And by changing the least significant bits of these, basically it, it disrupts, or, or not, not so much disrupts, but it, it rather minimizes the visual differences between the original image and the image containing the, the payload. So, yeah, it, it's only three bits from the red channel, three bits from the green channel, and, and two bits from the blue channel that change. So it will be very marginal shifts in color that should generally be um, unperceptible to the, the human eye. And then they took it to a next step. They, they were using some encryption as well. Oh, lots of encryption. Yeah. So the, the actual payload itself is encrypted using AES, AES-128 with a, a key hard coded in the binary. Then I believe it DXORs the payload after it's been read out. And then all it really relies on, on disk is the loaded DLL and the image. So the image is read into memory. The bits are sort of pulled out of the image to reconstruct the, the byte buffer with the encrypted payload. That's decrypted in memory using AES. Then it's deobfuscated using XOR. That yields a shellcode buffer, which is RC4 encrypted. So that's decrypted. Then there's another launcher DLL. That contains another payload that's RC4 decrypted and inflated using LZMA. That contains another backdoor DLL, which then inflates another uh, payload using LZMA. And finally, we get the C2 module in, in memory. So very sort of complex infection injection chain occurring in memory there. The point of that is to hide it from systems that might be trying to detect it? 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's to bypass uh, defenses, really. So by keeping as little as possible on disk in terms of the payload embedded in the image and the loader DLL, it really minimizes the, the chance for security software to flag it. The loader DLL itself is actually incredibly lightweight, apart from sort of decoding the image allocating some executable memory, copying some shellcode to it and running it, it doesn't do an awful lot. And then after that, all of the next stages occur in memory. So again, there's not a lot of options for uh, security software to sort of hook it and grab it at that point. All of the sort of subsequent DLL and shellcode layers are then injected into the same address space, which often makes it hard for uh, security software to, to pick it up and flag it. So yeah, it's really just trying to evade detection. That's sort of the main purpose of this convoluted sort of infection and, and loading chain. And then once it is in memory and that process begins, then what's going on there in terms of the back door and uh, the other things it's trying to do? Really anything. So initially, when we discovered this at the, the back end of uh, 2018, we'd seen them loading a couple of payloads that related to DNS tunneling backdoor that APT32 are known to have developed and, and used heavily. But subsequently, since the paper's been published and pushed through marketing, we've actually seen them quite recently using the same style loaders, the exact same images described in the paper, but delivering other payloads as well. So uh, hmm. things like Cobalt Strike beacons, and other, yeah, other tools from the, the APT32 arsenal. Now, it's interesting because you, you were saying that part of this was intentionally lightweight, uh, but then later in the research, you discuss how elements of this have a lot of junk code included in them, which makes the files larger, but, but harder to uh, reverse engineer. Absolutely. So that junk code is occurring within the payload that's injected into memory. So it's not hmm. really present in the, the on-disk uh, loader DLL. And yeah, it, it's probably a fairly crude garbage opcode generation routine. Yeah, it, it will modify a lot of registers, a bit of stack-based variables, but all neatly wrapped around two instructions. So one that pushes the flags to the stack and one that pops them them off back into the flags register. And Thankfully, most of the garbage opcode is, is neatly housed between those two instructions. So it's not too uh, trivial to ignore that code, read round it, and um, get an overview of what's happening. Uh, it, it does change some of the logic flow from a, the basic compiled application. But yeah, it, it's largely just designed to annoy analysts, really. And <laughs> as soon as you can find a nice way of cheating it, it it's not too problematic. Hmm. So in, in your estimation, uh, how would you rate the sophistication of what's going on here? I'd say it's pretty highly sophisticated, absolutely. As with everything that the Ocean Lotus Group develops, it's all to a high standard. It's clearly been developed well, tested well. The people who are writing it definitely have a very good understanding of not just what they're trying to accomplish, but how the security industry works, how we're going after them, how we're trying to track and monitor them. So they're you know, constantly evolving. It's, it's a cat and mouse game every day. But yeah, it, it's definitely been well funded and well developed as with all of the other tools uh, we've seen from Ocean Lotus. And what are your recommendations for folks to best protect themselves against this? Well, from a purely shameless standpoint, I would say install Silence Protect and Optics. But no, just more general advice for you know people who might be experiencing this or problems of this is that things like EDR software, so Endpoint Detect and Response, it can be very, very powerful in helping to track these things down at the end of the day. You know, I, I've often tried to take the standpoint when dealing with these types of attacks that if somebody wants to target you and they want to get in, they probably will. And, you know, after that, perhaps after your, your first line of defenses have been breached, then having software such as Optics, EDR software that is able to monitor and assess the behavior of, of threats on a system and allow you to easily query that. Yeah. Perform analysis based on, on functionality. It's really going to help out at the end of the day. In terms of the steganography itself, are there tools available that are looking for these sorts of things? Can you protect yourself from that specific type of attack? Not really. So on the first part as to whether there are tools to, to detect it, there are some good analysis tools. I would say they are more meant for sort of back-end processing, for reverse engineers and analysts to use in their sort of daily workflows. 
they can help to spot data that's been embedded or encoded in images, but only certain encoding algorithms. So, you know, this is ways of, of stuffing the, the bits and bytes into RGB color values. Now, what we've seen from some of the commercial off-the-shelf tools is that they will use a certain subset of algorithms for embedding this data, and the analysis tools will then sort of react to that and, and come and add corresponding decoders. What's happened in this case with the Ocean Lotus steganography is that they seem to have been aware of these tools up front, and they have crafted the algorithm in such a way that there were very few uh, differences when compared with the original image, but um, they've also been very careful not to trigger or, or make these tools trip up and detect their image and automatically decode and pull out payloads. So we, we've written a little script as part of the white paper that will help people do that, but I'm sure it would be very trivial for them to, to alter the algorithm in a way that would break my script or break other analysis tools and sort of render it obsolete. So from that perspective, there aren't too many bits of security software or monitoring software that are really going to help out here. And of course, everything is AES encrypted at the end of the day. So even if we could pull the data out, it's still an encrypted blob and we'd have no idea how to handle it or, or process it without the original key, which we probably wouldn't have at that point. Hmm. Yeah, so the, the game of cat and mouse continues. It does, day in, day out. Been doing it for uh, 18 years now. Our thanks to Tom Bonner from BlackBerry Silence for joining us. The research is titled Ocean Lotus Steganography Malware Analysis. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to Juniper Networks for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at juniper.net slash security or connect with them on Twitter or Facebook. And thanks to Envail for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at Envail.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick. Technical editor Chris Russell. Our staff writer is Tim Nodar. Executive editor Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.